Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools, lecture number, what are we at, 24? We have the most important individual training differences. We have listed 16 of them. These are from the upcoming, or depending on when you watch this, already released um, Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training book. And in the chapter on individual differences, which is the last chapter of the book, last main chapter, we cover a, a bunch of examples, 16 of them, that are what we consider the most important uh, variables to keep mindful of uh, that are different between individuals when designing programs, when evaluating programs, when selecting programs, so on and so forth. Uh, here's the list on the first slide for you. You can pause the video if you'd like and look at it and scroll to one that you like. Um, we're going to take all of them. Are there more than 16 variables? Of course. Did we miss some probably pretty important ones? Yes. But this is kind of a grand tour. And it's not so much to show you how to treat every single one of these, because we could do a whole lecture on every single one of these. And the book actually has more or less that. Um, the point is uh, to give you some examples uh, to cover the very important things, but also give you examples of, okay, individuals are different, uh, both you know between individuals and within one individual over time. What are some examples of how that can change programming, can change our approach, or what do we look at differently? After this lecture, you should have a much more nuanced view of program design and really understand it. When someone says, well, individual differences matter, you'll understand how they matter and have a really good toolbox to apply to when you design your own program or evaluate a program, you'll have a lot of really good things to keep in mind to know, you know how much individual differences do play a role and maybe how much they don't. So let's get right into it. First one, and uh, these are not necessarily in order of importance, but probably the more important ones are, are higher on the list, or rather first. So work capacity is our first one. And how, you know, we have two, two breakdowns we'll do for each one of these is presentation, how it presents in the training sphere, and then major implications that we want to list uh, what it take home, how to modify your program, so on and so forth. So the presentation of work capacity is that some lifters will just be able to do a whole lot more work in the gym than others. And it, the more hypertrophy specific way of putting it is some lifters will have, uh, be able to do a lot more non-junk volume. Cause you could just, anyone can just do volume if you keep them in the gym long enough. But if they get so tired that their, uh, systemic fatigue limits their local muscle activation, you know, that those reps at the local muscle start to be very, very far from local muscular failure. Not great. But some folks can crank out sets to close to local muscular failure endlessly. And some folks have, two or three sets per session they can do, and then they're pooped. So it's a work capacity difference, and it doesn't necessarily, we, we have one uh, next is recovery ability. Work capacity and recovery ability are very, very related, but they're not exactly the same thing, because you can be able to put out a crazy amount of work in one workout, but not be able to repeat that workout for five or six days because your recovery ability is low. On the other hand, your work capacity could be very low, but your recovery ability could be high, so as soon as you've done that workout, gee, later that day, you can repeat that, although short and unimpressive workout. But generally speaking, folks that have higher work capacity also have a higher rec recovery ability, because we know that work capacity means there's only so much volume you can do until you get junk volume, you should know that there's a huge variation between lifters and even within lifters on how much of that volume can you do until it becomes junk. And thus, what you want to do is for most folks that you're training for the first time, including yourself, you want to start with lower volumes because biting off more than you can chew is way worse than just not biting enough. Start with lower volumes, make sure they're not junk volumes, and then raise them as work capacity is both elucidated and increased. Elucidated means just revealed, right? So like at some point you could say, okay, here's three sets of bench, you know, roughly 10 reps and someone could do it and be like, okay, sweet. That was pretty easy. And I feel like I can do way more. Like, sweet. Okay. Next, next week we'll try that. Next week you go to four, five, six, et cetera. And it turns out they can do, they can squash a 10 set of chest workout or a 12 set of chest workout, no problem. And their work capacity over the week means they could squash, you know, like a hundred total sets of chest or something, no problem at all. You found out that they just have genetically very good work capacity. In addition to that, people's work capacity changes with training. So as they train over the period of weeks for sure and months and years, work capacity can go up. So don't just assume someone's going to get tired after a certain amount of work and also don't assume that they can do a certain amount of work. Start low, titrate up from there based on their ability to do the work. That is ability to have really, really great sessions where they're not centrally or systemically limited from activating their target muscles. At the end of the day, some people, the genetic gap still exists after years of training. So if someone starts with a very low work capacity and their work capacity improves a little bit, they could say, you know, my work capacity really sucks five years training later. 
there's probably not much they can do to really, really raise their work capacity without changing their training altogether for it to not be hypertrophy. And remember, work capacity is not a huge deal. The magnitude of response is really what we're looking for. We'll have something to say about that later. Number two variable, recovery ability. Okay, some lifters can recover both performance-wise and from soreness. Uh, and if they don't get sore, by the way, that's an increase, that's an indicator of high work capacity. Um, they could just recover more from per session volumes and more per week volumes, right? And the, the easy implication there, because we beat this concept to death in every other RP video, is start with lower volumes, proxy fatigue very carefully to make sure you understand if they have too much fatigue or if they have plenty of room to spare, and then uh, slowly titrate up or, or down as needed to make sure people are within their maximum recovery volume. And there are going to be large differences in recovery ability, thus programming volumes between two lifters and even the same lifter over time is going to be different. Something that you're doing now volume-wise could have crushed you five years ago and something that someone else does could crush you now or you could recover from it so easily you could do double or triple the work, right? So very, very important to understand that recoverability is hugely variable between individuals and within. And thus, anyone who asks, hey, like, what's my MRV or what's the MRV for chest? They're looking for a very average number among the entire population, but the bell curve is really, really large. You could have somebody who can't recover from more than eight sets per week of chest work and somebody who can comfortably recover from over 40, right? And yeah, so the average is kind of 20, somewhere in there in the 20s, but, uh, you know, that there's a huge genetic variation and you have to make sure that you're attending to that in your own training. Next is adaptive magnitude. There's sort of two discussions of adaptive magnitude. One is gain rate, we'll talk about later. And one is adaptive magnitude in the technical sense of how much better are you getting uh, essentially session to session to session. So per any unit of stimulus, some folks get more growth than others, and also they get uh, more uh, work capacity, and also they get better strength. So the major implication here for adaptive magnitude is how fast do you add weights or reps or sets week to week to week? And the sets thing is a work capacity thing, but that's part of adaptive magnitude. So if you have to add a lot of sets per week, that means the work capacity is expanding very highly. But there's also a question of adding reps and adding weight. You know, some people, and this this is, by the way, of course, varies hugely with training age, which we'll get to itself as a training variable later. But if someone's a beginner, their uh, adaptive magnitude could be like they could put 15 pounds on their squat or leg press every week for eight weeks straight and never lose a single rep, right? Being the same RIR or just a little bit lower at the end of that eight-week period. I mean, there's nobody at a high level that can do that, not even close. So at a high level or someone just with different genetics, they're going to be able to add maybe two and a half pounds every other week. Uh, and that's how fast they are adapting. So it's, it's super, super personal. People ask all the time, how much weight should I be putting on the bar each week? And we have other videos that dis discuss that. But essentially, it's like, okay, what, what is your RIR target next week? You did three RIR this week. It was, you know, 10 reps at 100 pounds. Next week is two RIR target because RR should descend roughly every week, every two weeks. And then, you know, how much weight do you need to put on the bar to get around 10 reps is really the question. And the answer to that question is very, very different. How fast do you get stronger? Some people, especially people with really good genetics and people early in their careers, uh, can add pounds and pounds and pounds, 10 pounds every time. Some people with, you know, towards the peak of their careers and, and or folks with not so great genetics, maybe add only two and a half pounds every other week or something like that, right? So there's no one golden answer and it has to be an auto-regulated, which is super, super important. Don't expect folks to be making some predictable jumps that you're like, oh, I wonder why they're not progressing. That question of wondering why they're not progressing should be answered holistically as to, okay, is their diet good? Is their recovery good? Is the program fundamentally sound? If those are all answers to check, 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 you still expect a great difference, right? It's it's like, uh, it's almost like expecting, you know, uh, everyone to score the same on a standardized IQ test or something like that. And if they don't score the same, you think, man, you know, there's something in our population must be making some people dumber and some smarter. Well, I think just genetically, some people are just more talented than others. This is not like a, it's not even a very controversial thing to say. So expecting them all to be exactly the same is ridiculous, right? You expect everyone should be brought up as high as possible. So if someone has something in their lives, which is like lead poisoning or something, and thus their IQ is lower, that's a serious problem you should address, right? It's not like, you know, if the IQ distribution is still there and there's some some people that are smarter than others, you're not going to be like, oh, there's something super wrong about that. Uh, the same thing with adaptive magnitude. Some people just make gains faster and have to be fed that. Because imagine someone who's making really fast gains, but you're like, no, 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 two and a half pounds every other week. That's the only way we increase. They're going to really quickly get so far away from the zero reps in reserve that they're going to have very, very inefficient training and vice versa. Much worse probably is when you try to take someone who can only gain two and a half pounds of strength on the bar every other week and try to push them into 10 
10 pounds every week. Uh, we've all done that, right? Especially uh, transitioning from beginners to intermediates. You still think you have beginner gains, but you don't. And you keep hitting walls, walls, walls. That's actually how you discover maximum recovery volume a lot because you're like, I used to be able to do that, but I can't, right? No shame in that. It's all adjustments to the individual and the breadth of variation is going to be very large. Expect that. Volume landmarks, super straightforward because we've heard like a gazillion things about this. The amount of work you need to do to maintenance volume, minimum effective volume, maximum adaptive volume, maximum recover volume is going to be different between lifters and within lifters over the same time course. So the major implication here is that one size fits all programming is absolutely no place in a scientifically based programming scheme like we're describing to you here. You got to at least try to roughly estimate all of these volume landmarks, even if it takes some time and always continually update them because not only do different lifters get different ones to start with, but they change over time. It used to be your MRV, might no longer be your MRV, it might be higher, it might be lower, only through proper auto-regulated training that detects performance and soreness and so on and so forth, can we get really good running data on how best to program for that. Anthropometry. People are built differently. Their limb lengths are different. Their limb ratios are different, okay? So some people have uh, really short torsos and really long arms and vice versa. Uh, really short legs, long arms, short arms, long legs, et cetera, et cetera. Their joint designs are different. Some people have shoulder joints that are very, very mobile. Some people that are less mobile. Some people that are very embarrassingly less mobile. Hips, so on and so forth. Uh, all, the, all the joints that you can think of have different levels of mobility and structural capacity, so on and so forth, between individuals. Flexibilities on the net balance are different. Some people can do a stiff legged deadlift with a tight back that goes below the floor if they're holding a bar. Some people can go just below their knees and their hams are tight. Not a thing wrong with that. You just have to address that, right? So here's the thing. Two major implications. One, techniques have to be uh, only general. When you say, how do I do a bent over row? There should be only generally probably about five tips. And then everything else should be tailored around the differences of the lifter, for example, even where you pull the bent over row, is it to the belly button? Is it right into the hip? Is it to the lower chest? That is gonna be different based on limb ratios. Like if your torso is really long, your arms are really short versus the other way around, you're gonna be pulling for the same lat activation generally, in the same rhomboid activation, you're gonna be pulling into two different spots potentially. That's a big difference, right? It's not all the same. And so you start with basic techniques for everyone and then individually people will alter their techniques over time. In addition to that, some exercises and some techniques will just favor some individuals versus others. So they'll have their preferences because they are built differently and stimulus to fatigue ratio analysis from earlier lectures will be the guide, okay? If you say to someone here, like, hack squats, they're great, do them. And they're like, my knees hurt. I don't feel my quads, my knees hurt. I don't feel like quads. And you sort of fixed everything you know you can fix. Why are you still doing hack squats? You put them on a high bar squat and they're like, oh my God, my quads are blowing up, my knees feel great. Are you really gonna say, well, no, you should be able to do hack squats? No, because they could just be built, built differently. A better example still is that a lot of people with really short torsos and long femurs, high bar squatting, any squatting really, it's not the best way for them to hit their quads because their, their ratios make squatting very posteriorly chain limited, right? It's really their ability to good morning the weight that's limiting them, not their quads. So if you want them to have their best quad development and by SFR, they're going to feel this, leg presses and hack squats are going to be way better. It's crazy that I'm saying this, right? Mr. Free Weight Compound Barbell. They're going to be way better than uh, barbell back squats. That doesn't mean you never do squats again, but that means as a first exercise, you might want to do... Uh, hack squats. You might want to do leg presses. And then later, when your quads are more limiting factor or rather theirs, then you thread those in. So always be on the lookout. Some exercises just won't jive with people and that's totally fine. Try your best to integrate them and make sure they're doing them right. But after that, things will look different and people will have their preferences and that's totally fine. There are no sort of golden standards there. Next one is fiber type distribution. This one's tough to figure out, but we have some hints of it based on how much endurance people have, like set to set drop off will be very low. They'll do like 10, 10, 10, 9, 9, 9, where someone with a very faster twitch dominant will be like 10, 4, 5, or like 5, 4, 3, 3, 1, or something like that, because those fibers lose endurance super quickly. Best rate, rep range growth response, people with a faster fiber type very likely prefer lower rep ranges. That's where their SFR is best, right? Um, specifically on the stimulus side, they get better pumps, more more robust muscle disruption, they get uh, you know, a huge perception of tension in the target muscle, mind muscle connection from lower reps versus higher reps if they're fast twitch, slow twitch, and the other way around. So the implications here is that 
some lifters and for some of their muscles, we'll get to the individual muscle stuff later as its own variable, they'll just, uh, you'll eventually have to bias their training into higher rep ranges or lower rep ranges, into moderate ones or lower ones, and so on and so forth. And there's also frequency biasing issue. Faster twitch fibers don't recover as fast as slower twitch fibers for, for the same dose of training, let's say eight sets. A faster twitch in muscle or individual can be recovered three or four days later where a slower twitch one, one or two. So slower twitch individuals actually can tolerate longer uh, bouts of higher frequency training uh, and more successfully. They also tend to be not as strong, which means that their joints don't take as much of a beating, again, furthering that divide. So if you have a muscle or your individual generally is more slower twitch, you know, higher frequency programs are just going to be on average, even if we take into account, uh, account block changes, right? Lower and then higher and then higher still, the average frequency will be higher for folks with slower twitch fibers than faster twitch fibers. Now, interestingly enough, if you take a look at folks with the fastest twitch fibers on average, they're usually the ones that end up being professional bodybuilders. And it's kind of no coincidence that a lot of those folks train with very low frequency, usually because they can't recover. They're also super strong. So you tell a professional bodybuilder to train his back with bent over rows hard twice a week, he's going to be neither recovered at the muscular level nor at the connective tissue level potentially for something like that. So something to keep in mind as to why we see differences, right? Responses to different growth pathways, hypothetically or rather theoretically, some folks will get a, a ton out of tension. Some folks will get a good response out of just mechanical tension, but some folks really, really get a ton out of metabolites. Others don't. Some to cell swelling, others don't. So the implication here is that you just have to bias towards rep range and techniques where the folks have the highest SFRs. But notice how important of a concept a stimulus to fatigue ratio is, right? Especially that part, uh, not especially, but particularly the part of you know, the stimulus checklist of, you know, do you have a mind muscle connection? Are you uh, getting pumps? And are you getting muscle disruption? And those sort of three items, which are in an early lecture checklist, folks will get them in different rep ranges based on which growth pathways you exploit. So some people, you know, who get a huge response out of cell swelling and who get a really huge disruption out of metabolite stuff, uh, you know, they'll do myo reps and it'll change their life. They'll be like, oh my God, my biceps. I feel like there's something deep inside my biceps that's wrong. Whereas some other folks that go on straight mechanical tension, myo reps start with a set of 10 to 20 reps. They might do that and be like, oh, I'm tired. And then they're just tired, tired, tired. And they do more sets. And they say, you know, are you pumped? They're like, yeah, I don't, not really. But, you know, I'm just not getting the tension I feel like. And then you, you have them do straight sets of eight dumbbell curls. And they're like, this is the greatest, like, feeling of tension I've ever gotten in my muscles. Like, I swear to God this is awesome and then they get really sore. So that's just different growth pathway responses. It can alter muscle to muscle as well. So some, some, something to keep an eye on and always apply stimulus to fatigue ratio and bias your training into where it seems to be indicating the most effect. Number eight, this is much more of a theoretical point, but just something to keep in mind is initial muscle sizes are hugely individually different and there's tons of genetic variation. Not everyone starts with the same muscle size. So the implications here uh, is that, you know, if you look at someone who's been training maybe a few years and they're really jacked uh, versus someone that's been training a few years and they're not so jacked, that person who is jacked may not know anything more than the person who's not so jacked. They just started with more muscle uh, at the same time. And we'll talk about gain rates actually in the next slide. They could have not only started with more muscle, but they're gained faster too on sheer genetics. So you say, oh man, you know, like that guy, he's uh you know, he really has things figured out. He's only been lifting for three years and he's huge. Well, you really think someone who's been lifting for three years has it all figured out? Unless he has like a genius IQ and has been studying exercise science in school for years before he started lifting, you know, it's probably like, just probably just genetics, right? What you really wanna look for more than how big someone is, especially when they're early in their career, how big do they get later in their career? And also, given where they started, have they made impressive gains? You know, show me someone who started at 120 pounds and over time earned their gains to get to 150, 160. I'll show you someone who probably figured some things out. Show me someone who started at 150, 160 pounds and then is 170 a couple of years later. I'm, I, don't color me impressed, but that's a 170 lifter versus a 150 lifter in the first example. A lot of people will see that 170 lifter and be like, that guy clearly knows what he's doing, which could be the furthest from the truth. Look to people who have made gains given their genetics, not written their genetics to either start really big or make big gains, which takes us to number nine, which is gain rates, our next uh, individual changing variable. Uh, the higher adaptive magnitudes in the short term that we talked about earlier usually lead to different gain rates in the long term. And at a, at a biochemical level, some people just gain muscle faster, plain and simple, even if they don't get that much stronger as you would expect. 
So th- this is kind of like a pretty gnarly one because it's like super, super reality slap in the face point. But here's the deal. Individuals with better gain rates usually respond best to all programs. Like you look at people who are really genetically well off and you say, hey, like, how did you grow your legs? And they're like, look, I've tried 531, I did West Side, I did Juggernaut Method, I did like HST training, I did, you know, uh, dog crap, I did all that stuff. And they're like, which one was best? And they're like, man, they, they all worked. My legs got huge on every one. You're like, okay, thanks for nothing. Like, that's great. And on the flip side, there are folks who are hard gainers who are going to be looking for this magic program that's going to turn them into an easy gainer. I can promise you right now that doesn't exist. Almost every easy gainer was an easy gainer their entire time that they lifted, period. Alternatively, some people can figure out that they were doing something very wrong. And when they change it, they unlock some really, really good gains. Not nearly as common. But to think if you're not doing something really wrong, like training at double your MRV consistently or half of your MV or something, if nothing's really wrong with your program, you can do better with a better program, but it won't be this order of magnitude better, right? You're not climbing trees to get to the moon. That's just not going to happen, right? So if you're basically riding the equivalent of a bicycle for your gains, and someone's riding the equivalent of a race car, no mods to your bike are gonna get you to race car speed. But they could get you from 30 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour, whereas the race car is going from 180 to 250 or something, right? Different, different sort of dynamic there. So don't compare yourself to other people and be like, why is he getting gains like that? Do your best. And a lot of it is very, very much genetic. There's some not so great, but hints of direct research into this, where they found that changes in program design don't account for hardly 10% of the differences you see just genetically between individuals. So, and this is a point I've made before, if you see an IFB Pro with pecs as thick as phone books, you probably are unproductively asking the question of, what exact rep range does he do? Is it the cable flies or is it the pec deck? For the love of God, it's mom and dad. Mom and dad and, you know, our all of our favorite parents, the needle, right? Am I right? Ah, a little stereo joke there. But on a serious note, um, you know, that person clearly dedicated themselves for years. They clearly ate a hypercaloric diet. That's one of those big fixes that can change a bunch of things. But the minutia is not where it's at. Gain rates are different for people. It's just something you have to accept and work your best with, period. Maximum growth potential. Different than gain rates, believe it or not, as soon, so your maximum growth potential is essentially a two-factor problem. Factor one is you start with muscle cells and they can individually hypertrophy in the, until they get only so big. And then factor two is these muscle cells can take nuclei that are in your satellite cells, the nuclei donate into the muscle cell, and thus they can get even bigger because they don't get big past a certain point when the nucleus can't communicate to the outsides of the cell. That's called the myonuclear domain ceiling. It's like having a, a, like one city government for a city of a million people is fine, but a city of like 35 million people that spans 200 miles, like you're probably going to have to get some suburbs going in there because the one city government is going to do that real poor. Like, you know, imagine the size of their, their bus system, like parking lot. It's going to be insane, right? And that's the equivalent of your nucleus. It can only control so much area around it. So once your individual cells grow as big as they can, and this happens rather smoothly, satellite cells start getting inserted. When you run out of satellite cells, it's still not clear to researchers that you can replicate satellite cells. The answer, the best guess is an 80-20, probably not, or just not to a great extent. So when you run out of myonuclear domain and then all the other satellite uh, cells incorporate and your your final muscle cell size for every cell, you just don't grow much, hardly at all, right? When this occurs depends both on how fast incorporation occurs and how good your training is and how much weight you're gaining, but largely depends on how many satellite cells you have. Because if you have uh, really big initial muscle cells, and this has already been shown to be the case in real individuals, you can actually start out pretty jacked And you can get really fast gain rates too, but then after two or three years, you sort of peter out and you just don't get many more gains. Whereas other people who started out smaller, their individual cells are smaller, but they have this crazy huge dormant pool of satellite cells and they continually get inserted, 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 and the cells grow, 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 grow. And all of a sudden they look like Mr. Olympia and they're done growing 25 years later. 
Thing is, you don't know which one of those people you are and you won't until you hit plateaus and try to solve them with your best approaches and only then realize, okay, this is just about as big as I'm going to be getting. It occurs differently for some people. Some people reach their plateau after, gee, really like you know, three or four years, more likely like five to seven for many people. And not absolute plateau, but when the stuff goes like this, he's still making gains, but very, very slowly. And for some folks, they literally get robust gains for 20 years or more. And, you know, you don't know which one you are. So before you say you're at your genetic ceiling, keep training for a few years just to make sure and apply all your best strategies. Sorry. And lastly, you don't know what your maximum growth potential is. There are averages for populations for sure, but you could be a very big exception to that. So don't think, okay, I'm five foot nine. I went to this online calculator and some of these are pretty good calculators. I should weigh 170 pounds. You don't know that. Try your best and you may end up all of your best weapons put forward over five years. You might end up at 155 or all of your best weapons put forward after five years. You may end up at 205 pounds in a natural world pro. You never know. You just have to try. Next, general muscle shape. This one's really, really straightforward. The general shape of your muscle, with some exceptions that there is some regional growth, is really, really highly genetically determined, okay? That doesn't mean it's 100% genetically determined, but really, really high. So any program that pours a lot of resources into changing the muscle shape or reshaping it versus just general, generally getting it bigger is probably a bit misuse of resources. So a lot of times folks with not so big quads say, you know, like I really want more outer quad sweep. Which leg extension variable should I like do? Which, which way should I point my feet? And my, my first thought is usually like, you can point your feet wherever the hell you want. Nobody's going to notice your quad sweep if your quads are the size of pencils. Why don't you get your quads really big? That's the real best way to use your time. You're actually, as a muscle gets bigger, it fundamentally changes shape as well because that size changes its shape. And you know, like if you have a bicep that's really small, it looks long and stringy. It doesn't really matter what shape it is eventually going to be. As it grows, it almost certainly grows more in the middle and everyone gets a bigger bicep peak when they get bigger. So first really put your, your, uh, you know, your efforts into getting bigger overall. And when you do put your efforts into changing muscle shape, know that those are very, very, very small differences that you may not ever realistically be able to detect in your program. And also, if clients come to you and say, I want to change your shape of my muscles, you had better be giving them some version of this talk that that's not a very wise thing to do. Intramuscular, sorry, intramuscular differences. This one is huge. Different muscles in the same lifter will differ greatly in nearly all of the variables that were listed before, okay? Their MRV, their MEV, their adaptive rate, their peak adaptation. Because some people will say, you know, my triceps respond really well to training, but my biceps simply won't grow. What am I doing wrong? Well, you may be doing nothing wrong. Your triceps just have bigger initial cell size and a huge myonuclear domain, or sorry, a huge uh, reserve of satellite cells, and your biceps may have neither or some, some you know, less optimal combination of those two things. You were just, you were destined to have bigger triceps than biceps. Does that mean you need to not optimize for bicep training anymore? No, of course not. You just have to have realistic expectations. And... Because muscles can uh, differ in fiber type uh, differences and also in the, which pathways they respond best to, you have to understand that you have to seek your volumes and your SFRs for every single muscle by itself. Okay, if three sets of 10 or you know, sets of eight really strict work really well for your hamstrings, something completely different. Tons of my reps could work better for your chest. You just never know. So what we really don't want is for you to take something about your body or a particular set of muscles, just automatically apply it to everything else. Here's another really big problem. People will say like, hey, what program did you go best, grow best from? Was it a heavy program or a lighter program? The real answer to that usually is like, well, you know, some of my muscles grow really well from heavier training. Some grow well from lighter training. For example, my own training, my hamstrings grow super, super well, and my glutes as well, from relatively lower reps and heavy weight. And my quads are sort of intermediate, whereas my side delts, that's not nearly the case. So when someone says like, hey, do you, do you like training heavy for size or light for size? It really depends on the muscle. And of course, a combination of all of them for everything, but there's just a certain amount of growth I won't be able to get with sets of 30 for hamstrings that will absolutely be able to get for side delts or rear delts or something like that. So that's absolutely something to keep in mind. Don't just assume there's one rep range for your whole body. Training age is not biological age. Training age is how long you've been training. And as you train hard for years and years, your responses predictably differ. Now, here's the predictably part. It just gets harder to get gains given any input variable. You need more volume, but you can recover from less. Okay, you need more proximity to failure. You need higher frequencies, but you can't recover from as many. The window narrows. So a real big take home message for this is stuff that work well for you as a beginner will not necessarily work best for you now. Training has to change and 
Because a lot of people will say, man, you know, back, and I've literally heard people say this, my own clients in, in many cases, you know, back in high school, I did this like three by three bench program and I gained 50 pounds on my bench. I was like, what was your bench when you started? They're like, 135. What was it when you ended? 185. Sweet. So to get a 185 bench, that's a great program. Now we're trying to get you to 330. Do you really think the same program is going to be great? And we could even try it. And it turns out the program sucks. And be like, what happened? What's different? Your situation is very different, Right. Like, you know, if you go, if you're a Green Beret or something like that, and you go sort of teach an army how to fight, you know, if they're like starting off with nobody's had combat experience and they have sticks and stones, the way you teach them is going to be very different. And what is going to help them the most is going to be very different from people that have been professionally trained and know how to operate explosive devices and their snipers and stuff. Both can be made better, but it's very, very different stuff. And you can't just be like, hey, you know what really worked in our last mission was teaching people how to throw rocks better. Um, we should teach these professional grenadiers how to do that. Well, they already know it is insane and they have grenades, not rocks, right? It doesn't make any sense at all. People do this in training all the time. To think back to high school, man, what really used to work for me is that's a nice notion, but you have to be willing to adapt. And if you're looking at a pro bodybuilder who's been training for 20 years and you've been training for one or two, you may have serious, serious problems trying to apply their program to yours because their training age is completely different. Next up, related concept is biological age, just how old you are. Older individuals can just generally expect smaller gains. Uh, but they can also benefit from a more methodical approach because the thing is, is that when you're older, you know, 30s, especially 40s and 50s, yes, your gains will be not as great as when you were younger, uh, even if you just start in your 40s and 50s. However, you're probably not a stupid person anymore that goes partying for three days straight, doesn't drink any water or eat any food like you used to when you were in your 20s and your raver days. Now you probably have a family and a job and you're just a responsible person and you can execute a meticulous plan. You can make up a lot of difference, not all of it, for younger populations just by being better at executing the plan when you're older. The worst thing in the world, and I've met folks like this, who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and still have a bro mentality to lifting. Like they'll disappear for a while, they'll do one body part per week, like they try to hit hard and go to failure, and they just wave their hands why they're not there getting gains. That's insane, right? They need to be doing things more intelligently. At the same time, just make sure you're realistic, and if you have clients, make sure if they know this, age is not just a number. If you're 45 years old and you want to put on muscle and get leaner, you have to have different expectations, just tempered ones, than if you're 25 years old. And if you say, well, back when I was in my 20s and I was playing D1 ball, I was 260 with abs, and now you're you're 57 years old. Like, can I have that again? Like, no, you can't have that again. You're the only 57 year old, 260 with abs. That's nonsense, but you can do really well, just have to be realistic. Because people say like, this is one of these things that's a personal pet peeve of mine. Uh, basically these notions and sort of saccharine phrases people bandy about for no reason at all to make themselves temporarily feel good by illusoring themselves to the world at large. Uh, one of my least favorite is age is just a number. It just makes no sense on any level other than to tell people, hey, like, just try your best. You'll be fine. You're not dying. That's great. The rest of it's totally wrong. Age absolutely matters. You have to take it into account. Next one is sex. Sex is a good thing. People like to have sex and you probably would too if you weren't watching YouTube videos all the time. Just kidding, sort of. Uh, sex here we mean it's another term for gender, right? Male versus female in this case. And the thing is, is that it's a little bit different with males and females. Females because you recover from and benefit from a much higher per session volume uh, and relative volume and load combos, which is to say if you have females do one RIR sets of roughly 10 reps, they can crank, crank, crank local muscular failure every single time, very little systemic limitation, and get sets of like 11, 11, 11, 10, 10, 9, 9, 9, and just keep going, whereas males a lot of times have a big first set and they just crash. They just don't have the set to set recovery ability and the session to session recovery ability. Females can usually do more, very high intensity frequency of sessions per week. You give me a male that can do three per week, his, you know, genetic counterpart female is going to be able to do three or four, or sorry, four or five sessions per week, no problem. So, SFR should guide you in this if you're using it intelligently with female clients or if you yourself are female, just know that it's not going to be the same thing as our predominantly, most of this hypertrophy stuff is something males do. Don't just copy male programs. Males may say, you know, anything for, for chest more than two times a week and I'm trashed. 
That's nice. Try it yourself as a female. Start low. Start with two sessions a week. You might end up be seeing that there's like gaps in training when you're not sore and you're completely recovering. You're just waiting around for no reason. Try three. Then try four. And you might see like, oh my God, with four times a week, I'm getting the best chest gains of my life. Why the hell did I ever do two times a week? That's one of the predictable differences. Another one to keep on the lookout, and this is very similar in that regard, Females can do lots of heavy lifting back to back to back to back, sat, 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 and session to session to session and have no problems with recovery, uh, even on a connective tissue level or muscular level, which is great. And the reason that's great is because they'll have to use that to get good gains because a lot of times for females, they're so good at buffering and so uh, not, uh, they don't generate so many metabolites to begin with and they're so good at buffering them that metabolite training, uh, drop sets and supersets and stuff, a lot of times just don't work nearly as well for females as they do for males. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Your female training, if you're a male trainer and you're writing female training programs, these things should baffle the shit out of you and shock you and look at them after a while and be like, there's no way anyone can survive this, but females can, right? You'll see them doing like heavy back work four times a week, sets of five to 10. You'd be like, if I tried that, my lats would rip off my body. I would be vomiting blood by a week and a half. They can do it, right? And if you do a workout with them, you're like, this is going to be so hard. We're going to superset this to this to that. They just crank out all the supersets, go to failure. And at the end of the workout, they're like, okay, so I feel pretty good. And you're like, what? You're not going to die? They're like, yeah, I feel fine. I'm re not really even crampy. And you're like, how the hell is this working? Metabolites don't work as well with females. So be wary of that. More hardcore heavy work for them and they'll, they'll do just fine with it. Another super quick one, females on average, this is almost certainly not uh, true for everyone, on average, they tend to probably misestimate IRR different than males. Males probably come closer to failure in their average set if you just tell them they do two IR. Males probably come closer to set uh, failure than females. So for the average female, starting them at two or three IR at the beginning of their program and working up from there might be a better idea than three or four IR, which is where you might start males. So that's something else to consider as well. Next one, pretty obvious one, is lifestyle. Individuals have different applications. This is this is why I said this, this, these are not in order of importance because this one is hugely important. People have different applications of how much sleep they get, how much relaxation they get, how much nutrition uh, is on point versus not, supplementation, so on and so forth. So major implications here is don't expect folks with poor nutrition or poor sleep to recover from as much training as those who get them right. Um, and don't expect higher gain rates and let your clients know this as well. And I've put a note to myself here, this, the, the Wall Street story. Uh, myself and Nick Shaw, the co-founder of uh, Renaissance Periodization, we used to train a lot of Wall Street folks, like literally in New York City at a very high-end gym. And a lot of these folks would say, listen, I, I can't eat super well. I'm too busy. Uh, I don't get sleep. I don't sleep. I work. I'm living life. I'm, work, I'm a workaholic. But I'm willing to come to the gym every lunch hour and I'm willing to burn it. What can you do for me? if that's the case, because I'm willing to work extra to compensate for the sleep and the food, you just have to tell them that it's just not how it works. I mean, you can bring them down gently, you can bring them down not so gently, but at the end of the day, that's not a negotiable thing. There's no making up for a very severely depleted lifestyle. And in some sense, if you decrease sleep and food, your MRV goes down, you actually can't train more. The ideal response from a stimulus fatigue perspective may actually be to train less, which is crazy, right? In other words, there's just no getting around the stuff. You have to be keen on two things. One, if there are lifestyle differences, uh, you have to integrate them into training and understand that they're going to limit MRV, raise MEV, so on and so forth. And two, make people aware of how important lifestyle is so that they don't think just because they lift weights, they're good to go and they're going to get all these great results. And that if they just lift more weights, they're going to get great results, even if everything else sucks. If you get good sleep, if you get good nutrition, and you're really doing a good job, you'll be one step ahead of the, the curve in that one. Summarize this entire lecture, all programs should begin when you don't know the lifter or if it's yourself with lower volumes and lower average frequencies because it's better to be safer than sorry in this case, right? Then you need to adjust volumes and frequencies as needed based on very different responses you'll get. Some people will be able to do a lot of volume. Some people will be able to progress really fast. Some people will be able to do highly frequent training more often. Some won't. It's not something you push. It's something you detect and alter for. And the same exact process of starting conservative and working in works for exercise selection, rest times, techniques, all the way down the line. People are different. The fundamentals work for everyone, but once you establish the core fundamentals, 
pay attention to responses and alter training as needed for essentially the highest gain rates per an individual and the highest stimulus to fatigue ratios to give you a hint at what those gain rates can be. Folks, that's it. See you next time.